Hi there. Um, my name is Lisa Burkilo. Um, welcome to the Advanced Fetal Imaging Conference. Um, I have a short presentation for you on uh, cervical scanning in the second and third trimester. Um, it's called the cervical smile um, because there's many different moods and uh, appearances to our cervix. Um, and I'm here to talk about all of them. So uh, for all of you who have your computers on in the background as you go about your day, um, I encourage you to uh, turn up the volume and take a quick listen. And I would like to share with you some tips and tricks on endovaginal scanning. The objectives of my uh, presentation this afternoon uh, are to include some tips and tricks on what I do for cervical scanning, also some troubleshooting on how you can get the best endovaginal scan for your buck, um, how endovaginal scanning um, is a useful tool in predicting the risk of preterm birth, um, using endovaginal scanning also for uh, the location of the placenta, the placental position, um, and exclusion of vasa previa. So I was looking for a um, anatomy drawing of the cervix and there was just not any good um, netter or Gray's anatomy drawing. And then I came across this one on Pinterest and I thought it really depicted this beautiful um, gravid uterus with leaves and berries and eggs for the ovaries. And then down here is a very understated uh, little cervix. And as you can see, the cervix is a tube with an internal os and the external os, um, but without this little understated um, plug or cervix, uh, the rest of this beautiful um, pregnancy wouldn't exist. So what we do know is how to look at ultrasound images. And this is a uh, transverse ultrasound, sorry, sagittal ultrasound of the cervix. This is the internal os. You can see the amnion coming across the internal os and then the external os. You wanna make sure that you've got a nice long uh, cervical canal to include the mucosa opened at both ends and easily identified. So who gets an EV? Do you get an EV and you get an EV? Our EV patients are going to be our patients who have an intrinsic weakness of, our, of their cervix, um, cervical insufficiency caused by trauma, surgery, uh, previous instrumentation like a delivery, DNC, or a cerclage, a stitch in your cervix. Um, we're going to use EV for the assessment of preterm birth um, by using the cervical length. Um, um, our patients that have had inflammatory or infectious processes of their cervixes will get uh, endovaginal scanning. Our patients that come in with contractions, and this is something that I've learned while I was preparing this presentation, was is a short cervix a result of contractions or do does a short cervix cause contractions? Um, and of course, we're going to be using endovaginal scanning to look for suspected or confirmed either low-lying placenta, placenta previa, or vasa previa. With that in mind, we need to be cognizant about about not only locating that placenta, but looking for abnormal placentation. And with that, I mean looking for signs of accreta, percreta, increta, uh, knowing uh, where the placenta is and the appearance of the placenta. And if you also can stop and take some time to uh, notice if there's still myometrium um, left uh, interface between the placenta. So I thought the best way to go about this, um, there's a uh, saying, if you do something for 10,000 hours, you become a uh, master. And uh, I honestly believe that I might be a uh, endovaginal uh, master, maybe not 10,000 hours, but maybe at least 10,000 patients. So um, I systematically go through a checklist in my um, head and from memory for each EV that I do. And uh, I'm just gonna share all of this with you. 
So of course you explain whether it's their first EV or their 50th EV, what you're gonna do. You don't want any questions or any uh, confusion. We're gonna do an endovaginal ultrasound. This is the probe. Only this far is gonna go in. It's about the same caliber as a super tampon. I'm gonna put a little bit of wet jelly on the end. It shouldn't hurt you, but please let me know if it does. With this consent and explanation, you need to be aware and cognizant of your patient's needs and prior history. Uh, we don't know what we're walking into, if there's a history of trauma and we need to be sensitive to these needs of these people. Um, make sure that there is informed consent Ask if you believe um, they might need a chaperone. Um, if anything, if you feel an, uh, uncomfortable in any way, do not hesitate to have someone else in the room with you while you do your endovaginal scan. And of course, ask them if they have a latex allergy. Um, with the latex allergy, um, at my facility, we are um, given a choice of either a condom or a um, non-latex sheath. sheath. And uh, I prefer the condoms because they don't have, they are thinner and they don't have that seam right in the middle. So I feel like there's better contact with the probe. But again, personal preference or the preference of your patient. Absolutely get her to empty that bladder. That bladder is going to, uh, could cause um, um, abnormal lengthening of the cervix. And we don't want to do them any favors by abnormally lengthening that cervix. Make sure that the patient's position is prone, as prone as they can tolerate. I find them, if you could put them down slowly and easily, they can lay quite flat. Um, and that is for ease of the endovaginal and also to try and get that baby's parts away from the cervix, whether they be breech with the bum or uh, head down there. And the table height. Um, I'm a stander, so I like to stand up and have the table about the same um, same height as my hip so that I don't have an awkward position of my arm. If you do a lot of endovaginal scanning, you'll understand that they can be very hard on your shoulder. So whatever you can do to help yourself and keep good ergonomics is uh, beneficial for everybody. Um, be mindful when you're dressing that probe, make sure you have enough gel in the end of that um, uh, sheath, but not too much so that it's like spilling out all over. Um, and you're not going into a sterile field. So with a gloved hand, it is totally acceptable just to rub your finger at, uh, across the top to displace those bubbles so that they're not in your field of view. Then decide who inserts. In my facility um, and doing second and third trimester scanning with this epidemic of obesity and, um, and late gestation, my patients simply can't reach down there. So I make it quite well understood that I will insert the probe and they're by far and large mostly fine with that. But again, be sure that your patient is comfortable with whatever you both decide. And then image optimization. I want you to take your time. Once consent has been uh, established and you're ready to go, Take a look, make sure you know where you're going, get it into the vaginal vault, and then look at your screen and slowly insert the probe. Make sure that you've got a good sector width to include all of the cervix and the opening of the uterus. Um, you've got enough depth to see the posterior uterus. Um, you've got color available. And then what are you determining? Are you determining, are you looking for a short cervix? Are you looking for a cerclage? Are you looking for abnormal placentation? All of these things should be in mind before you even start. So you've now you've inserted the probe. I want you to start with a nice right to left sweep. And you can do this as many times as you feel comfortable until you know how much pressure you wanna do. This is a nice example of a little bit of funneling and a short cervix. But you can see as you go out to the side, you can falsely elongate that cervix. There's a little nebothian cyst that you can make note of. And again, and that funneling. Nice, easy sweep. Not all cervixes appear the same. 
Some have juicier mucosa than others. And this is a good example of one that has a nice thick and blackened mucosa. So you want to be cognizant and pay in mind to the um, amnion, the amnion coming across here, and this will determine your internal os and not to be mistaken for funneling. External os, a little bit of a smile of the cervix, but still a lot and really nice length. And sometimes those cervixes kind of frown at us. This is a cervix, the, a good example of a cervix that's pointed a little bit more anteriorly, but still lots of length, internal loss, external loss. And you can see that beautiful amnion coming across there, 4.8 centimeters. Another long cervix, but they don't have to be linear. They don't have to smile. They don't have to frown. Sometimes they look like a beautiful wave. And this one is 5.35 centimeters long. It's probably a little longer if you actually traced it out, but normal is normal is normal. And then you'll get that one that you put the probe in and it's like, I can't find it. I can't find both sides of it. I've got one end and I can't find the other. It's like when you're scanning a femur. As soon as you can see a little bit of it, stay on there and open it up. Open it up like you would a bone and elongate it. This one is pointing a little more posterior, but again, nice length to that cervix, just a little different orientation. Here's a nice example of a short cervix. Again, but here, I'm not sure if you would call this funneling, maybe just a plain old short cervix, but you wanna pay attention to where that amnion is. Internal loss external loss. And then there'll be the one that they right after the vaginal vault, you've hardly even inserted anything and there it is. Short little cervix, sometimes off to the left a little bit. There it is. Internal loss, external loss, fetal head. And then our good old color, Anywhere else in ultrasound, transfer, sagittal, tone around your color. Cervixes are no exception. This is a nice example of a venous flow right through the cervical canal, which was thought to be a stalk feeding a cervical polyp that was causing the patient to bleed. Mind your pressure. After doing many, many cervixes, you will realize that you can falsely elongate that um, cervix just by putting a little bit too much pressure. So this is this exactly the same patient, a few seconds apart, and I intentionally put some pressure on here. You can see she's got a little bit of funneling, but on my first image, it's measuring 1.9 centimeters. And then once I came out and let back in, and then just where it naturally sits, and you will know, you will see, feel it, it's shrunk down to 1.26 centimeters. There's quite different management um, between 1.9 and 1.26 centimeters. So mind your pressure. going to talk quickly about cerclage and sludge. A cerclage is a stitch that an obstetrician will put into the cervix and it's circumferentially around in the cervix and it actually kind of keeps that cervix uh, closed to um, elongate the pregnancy or continue the pregnancy. So we might be asked to see if there is in, an intact cerclage or if it's not intact, if it's in the right place, if there's any residual length to the cervix, and if there's any funneling that is accompanying that, and if there's any evidence of sludge or debris in, inside the uh, uterus, um, and it, it'll appear like this layering debris, and whether that debris is blood or whether it's infection is not for us to know, but it's definitely up to us to report it. This is a still image of a cerclage. This is a sagittal image of the cervix, in, uh, ex, internal os, external os. And this is the anterior lip. And you can see the shadowing coming down of the cerclage. Then you look at it transversely. I encourage you to look at every single uh, cervix transversely. It's a transverse still image of the entire uh, cerclage all the way around the cervix. 
and this is the sludge we were talking about, you see this layering and it'll uh, lay dependently against there. Um, there's no placenta around there. It will move. Um, if you move the patient, it'll disperse a little bit. Um, but again, it's worth noting, short cervix and sludge. This is a uh, sagittal sweep. Here's the anterior lip and the sludge that we were talking about. You can see that shadow and that'll show you that it's going all the way around anterior and posteriorly. Look at everything uh, in two planes, transverse uh, section of the cervix with this layering sludge. And quickly, just a quick sweep again through that cervix, there's that whole intact cerclage. I know it's been a wonderful conference so far, but it's late and getting late in the afternoon and we all need like a little stretch. About halfway done, everyone, stay, stay with me. We're just gonna talk about the reasons why we're doing these endovaginal scanning. Low-lying placenta. What is a low-lying placenta? It's when the placenta's inferior edge uh, encroaches, encroaches upon the cervix. So it's gotta be less than two centimeters from that internal os. With that being said, less than two centimeters from the internal os doesn't mean anterior or posteriorly. We all know that that placenta can be anywhere. It can be right, it can be left, off to the south, or uh, maybe a little bit to the north. Look in both planes. Sweep sagittally, look for that edge, and again, transversely, transversely, and look for that edge. This is a low posterior low-lying placenta. You can see here is the placental tissue, ends about here, and it is 1.3 centimeters uh, away from the internal loss, external loss. This is definitely a low-lying placenta. And this was a low-lying placenta, but I wanted to show you that it can be anterior. It can be anywhere. But this one has now moved internal loss, placental edge, and now we're 2.49 centimeters away. So this placenta is no longer low-lying. Placenta previa. What does previa mean? Well, previa means going before. So that means the placenta is gonna go before the baby. And we all know what a disaster that could be. And who's at risk for it? Well, our late geriatric mamas, isn't that awful? Um, um, and with our, uh, with our uh, aging maternal age, we are seeing a lot more placenta previas. Uh, multiparis, so think the gravita seven para six, She'll be at risk for placenta previa. Multifetal gestation, twins, triplets, quads, what have you. Cigarette smoking. I'm not sure what the pathophysiology is with placenta previa and smoking, but so be it. And then the biggie, prior cesarean section delivery, because cesarean sections are common. And again, with that, uh, with cesarean sections, we're also looking for abnormal placentation. So not only looking where that placenta is, if it's a previa, there also are you, you need to start to make note, is it starting to invade into the myometrium? You're looking for lacuna, you're looking for vascularity, but this is a whole different other lecture. It's a still image of a complete previa. You've got the internal loss here, edge of the placenta, amnion coming right over top of the internal loss, complete previa. And again, going right through, looks like a little bit of caught here, amnion coming right across, edge of the placenta, internal loss, complete previa. Turn on your color. When in doubt, turn on your color. Even when you're not in doubt, turn on your color. Amnion coming right across, internal os. Looks like a little bit of blood swirling in there, but because that amnion is coming right across, this is a placenta previa. 
Again, looking transversely, internal loss, you can see that blood, same patient, placenta coming right across there, document it in two planes. Why not? They're also gonna ask you how much it's overlapping by, because in the previous one, sometimes that placenta can actually, the cervix is not a good blood supply. It doesn't host placenta well. So it, in theory, it can actually kind of die off and the previa can resolve. But when you've got a patient like this that has this big posterior placenta and it's overlapping by 3.8 centimeters, there's a, another risk involved that it, this one might not resolve because it's overlapping by quite so much. And again, not all cervixes are choroid equal, neither are, are placenta previous. I uh, thought this was a good example of, this is a nice midline shot of the uh, cervix. And it looks like it's just low lying, 1.15 centimeters, come for a follow up, no big deal. Then we sweep over to the left and we can see this amnion coming right over top of the internal loss. This is a placenta previa. And last but not least, vasa previa, the biggie. The definition of a vasa previa is when the fetal vessels course through the membranes that overlie the cervix. So what does that mean and who's at risk? Well, if you can recall like a velamentous cord insertion. So you've got your big placenta instead of the cord plugging right into the middle of the placenta, it's plugged in off to the side. And then the vessels that connect the cord, <clears throat> pardon me, to the placenta could potentially cross over top of the cervix and cause a vasa previa. A succinturiate lobe or an accessory lobe um, where you've got a main placenta that's plugged into the cord and then it's got connecting vessels to the uh, extra lobe and that those extra vessels that connect the lobes can cause a vasa previa. And as I had mentioned before, these uh, resolving or low-lying placentas um, that kind of in fact die or, or um, yeah, and what is left after the placenta is gone are still fetal vessels, and that would cause a vasa previa. It's a simple image that I found, but I thought it explained at least well a couple of them. Um, as you can see, I think they were trying to uh, show a succinturiate lobe or the two lobes and then the connecting vessels. But if you hallucinate with me here, you could um, maybe see that this might have been a placenta, a complete placenta previa. And then because again, cervix is not a good blood source, this placenta part has kind of died away and what's left are these fetal vessels and uh, vasa previa. This is a still image of a sagittal cervix, internal os, external os, fetal vessels coming across the os, vasa previa. This is just a little bit left of the os. Again, it doesn't have to be anterior, posterior. Sometimes you they come off to the sides. You do not wanna miss these ones. Um, this was a succinturiate lobe, just a little bit to the left. These are the fetal vessels, but less than two centimeters away from the internal os. Beautiful example, external os, internal os. See the amnion and these fetal vessels, they're almost like stuck or adhere to the, uh, um, to the uterine wall and crossing right over top of the internal loss and the vasa previa. Um, they can be very subtle. They can be these little teeny vessels. Turn your color on every single patient. Free floating loop of cord. And then right in the amnion, you see end on here, internal loss, internal loss little fetal vessels, vasa previa. This is another succinturiate lobe. These were connecting vessels. And um, yeah, again, right into the amnion, right up against that uterus, fetal vessels, vasa previa. Um, and not to be, uh, not to be, discouraged when you see like there is the fetal cord here and then you're thinking is this just fetal cord well again use your criteria 
it's right up underneath that amnion. It'll be kind of fixed up against the uh, uterine wall, uh, internal os, adhered here, free loop of cord, black and white description. Turn on your Doppler. As soon as you see that fetal heart rate, for sure you know that you've got a vasoprevia as opposed to maternal vascularity, as we see with like some venous sinuses. And last but not least, this was an excellent case that we had just recently in our department. Um, she had a known complete previa and came in with bleeding, but I was surprised to see, I've scanned her a few times, but here we've got the internal os, a little bit of clot coming in there, external os, big previa. Big overlap. I apologize. I don't have um, the exact dimension on how much it's overlapping, but it's hard to tell whether it originated anterior or posterior, but I thought maybe posteriorly, but big overlap right over top of her internal os. And then we turn in the color internal os, and this is the cord insertion. I just never really saw anything quite so striking, but uh, yeah, there it is. I wanna thank you all for your time and attention and uh, staying awake for my 20 minutes of uh, cervical imaging. Um, appreciate all of you coming out and uh, thank you for your participation. All right, thank you, Lisa. And we have some questions. We still have some of our other speakers in the background too. So, um, you know, as I said to Lisa, feel free to, to throw the question out to Dr. Chandra, for example, uh, just a different perspective from a different site. Um, okay, so question number one, how long is too long for a cervical length? Um, I don't think that there is a cervix that is too long. We have seen them up to five centimeters, but if you are getting one at uh, greater than five centimeters, you have to wonder if you're, I don't know, just too oblique or measuring incorrectly. Right, Steph? I'm, I'm not sure how I, I've never seen one quite that long before. Yeah, as I was, uh, we were mentioning on the, on the break or before is that, you know, if I do a speculum exam for a pap smear or whatnot, I wouldn't see a 10 centimeter long cervix. Um, I would anticipate that would be uncomfortable. So it wouldn't make sense to have a 10 centimeter cervix. I did recently see a report where it said 84 millimeters and I'm like, eh, that doesn't seem right. So um, yeah, I, if it's over five, just, I would really just make sure technique is good. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, uh, this is a tough one, um, and maybe we'll have Sue uh, jump in as well. What are measurements with funneling short cervix in the presence of a cerclage, and do we need to see the cerclage connecting all the way uh, in transverse imaging? All right, Dr. Chandra, you're on for that one. Um, that definitely is a tough one, and I think there's probably nuances, because the thing about cerclage is most of the studies on cervix and short cervix were done not um, with that population, right? And because we think sometimes short cervix and their cervical insufficiency, that they're probably on a spectrum, but the studies were sometimes are done kind of as dichotomous things, like two separate groups. Um, when I, um, it seems to me like when our techs are scanning patients and they show me a transverse view of the cervix, it's always reassuring when it looks like the cerclage is around the cervix. But sometimes I feel like it might look on imaging that maybe it's off, fallen off on one side or it's loose. But at that point, I actually think we should be doing a speculum exam because it might look like that on ultrasound and it actually might be completely around the cervix. So I think at that point, you probably need clinical correlation. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, you know, again, and always recognize that there isn't good data about how to assess the cervix when you've got a cerclage, but just because there isn't doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Um, one, it's for the reassurance of someone who's had a mid-pregnancy loss, um, but there is, you see the difference. So I had a patient last night who I admitted who uh, had ruptured membranes uh, with a cerclage at uh, 29 weeks, and um, her cervix had shortened with the cerclage down to about four millimeters 
years with funneling and sludge. And so um, she had already been counseled, steroids had been given, for example, and then um, the inevitable happened. So um, there is something and we can see advanced cervical changes, but certainly, you know, a, a sort of a shorter cervix that's well approximated with no funneling um, with a cerclage to me is, is reassuring. So it's a combination of putting it all together with some degree of clinical experience too. Um, the next question is a, a fun one for anybody who's on the on our chat here who wants to join in about why does increased maternal age have an increased risk of previa? And you know what? I was I it was one of those things I keep I thought of that before, and I'm like, I need to look up to figure out exactly why that is because I have thought the exact same thing. Who wants to answer that one, Dr. Chandra? You're back on. Yeah. Or Dr. Obi, if you're there too, feel free. I'll pass it over to Dr. Obi this time. She's not, she's like, oh no, I'm not answering. <laughs> we don't really know is the answer, right? It's a, an association. An association doesn't mean causation. So if you look at all the placenta previas and you try and find out, you know, what are risk factors for having a placenta previa, late maternal age is one of them. Um, but there then then we develop theories to try and explain that but it doesn't mean that that's necessarily the case um Wait, what was the question oh, <laughs> the, the question is about late maternal age and placenta previa what is oh, the yeah. cause yeah and the truth I, is we don't really know yeah we're not sure but we thought it might have to do with the um perfusion and ability to implant properly of the placenta sometimes the placenta implants um inefficiently and doesn't really mobilize the way it should when the age is advanced is what I think, I believe I heard. Yes, previously. yes. And maybe with late maternal age too, they would have more assisted pregnancies, like mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. assisted yeah. uh, fertility. Yeah. And with that comes a bigger risk of uh, yeah. previa. Yeah. And higher parity, so more deliveries also is associated yeah. with that as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so is there any benefit to looking at the cervix after 32 weeks? There are some awesome questions here. Um, great. At our facility, our cutoff is 32 weeks, and for that, I am grateful. But <laughs> that is just for uh, preterm labor. I was thinking about this too. We I've scanned. 36, 37 weeks, especially if we're still considering a visa previa or low lying um, placenta, you might have to do it right up until delivery. Yeah, exactly. If it's for a different, and in some centers, they don't go as late as 32 weeks. I think people would do 28 weeks for cervical length screening as well. It's a bit, what about Edmonton, Sue? Yeah, exactly. In Edmonton, um, in our MFM unit, we use 32 weeks as well, like what Lisa said. And the reasons to do it afterwards are exactly why you say. Um, I always say to my techs that if I'm going to clear someone who had a previa and then was low lying and now is I'm not going to be low lying, I am going to use an endovaginal scan, use the gold standard to clear somebody for that. Mm -hmm. right? So we will use that after 32 weeks and also to look at um, fetal vessels or concern around um, velamentous fetal vessels phase of previa. Yeah. And there's a question about vasa previa about. Um, uh, you know, how significant will be the hemorrhage be at delivery? So I can answer that one. Um, if it's a true vasoprevia, uh, so if it's a fetal vessel that is uh, in close approximation or covering the cervical os, if you think about it, um, if a baby has, um, you know, 100 mils per kilo of blood, you have, you know, just, you know, 3.5 for a term baby, for example, of blood, and this is a blood vessel, it doesn't take long if you tear that vessel for that amount of blood to bleed in a, in a quick uh, fashion. So um, honestly, uh, if you, the mortality of undiagnosed vasoprevia, perinatal mortality, or, or, you know, fetal neonatal is over 60%, but if you have a diagnosis antenatally, it, this, it's goes down to 10%. Um, and that's by being aware of it and having um, a early planned uh, cesarean section. So um, they can be very significant is the answer. Um, okay, and uh, Lisa, can you have a section chariot lobe without a vessel attached to it? I don't think so. That's how it would survive, I think. Would you yeah. have to have a vessel to feed it? Yes, yeah. yeah. 
um, when we examine after a baby's out and we examine the placenta, if we see these little vessels that seem to be going from the edge of the placenta to nowhere, then that's one of our cues to say, wait a second, there may have been a suction chariot lobe that remains in the, pl in the uterus, which somebody should not go home with. It's not a good parting gift. Um, okay, I think um, pretty much like that's all of our time. Just one, that's a good one. I think we'll finish up with what's your contraindications for EV scanning during pregnancy? We'll finish up with that question. Um, well, PPROM for sure. Yeah. And if my patient says they don't want one. Exactly. Lack of consent. Yeah. Lack yeah. Of consent. Yeah. Um, I don't any, know. Any other um Sue, what or TT, uh, anybody else there? Any other contraindications you can think of? The only time I would do it with PPROM is if there's a concern around placental position, sure. and that was never documented before. So because we're not going to put the probe, like we're like the issue with uh, infection with PPROM is when we also then do a digital exam into the internal OS. And the good thing is the endovaginal camera doesn't go in there. So in generally, we don't use it for PPROM, but the only time I have is if we are having a question on, is it safe to have a vaginal delivery or not? That would be the only thing. And then if there was uh, prolapse membranes, um, you know, if we can see that transabdominally, like we're not gonna yeah. probe. Yeah. yeah, lack of a skilled operator, especially in those circumstances as well, would be another contradiction. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't call this a direct contraindication, but always triaging the patient before they even get to you. So sometimes you have to be careful when a patient has been sent to you who's actually actively still bleeding. Um, it's not a contraindication to the EV, but it's just a contraindication to the scanning itself. Yeah. I think, yeah, just That's, make sure the patient is very stable and not, you know, holes in, as we yeah. say. Good point. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, panel. Um, you. And I'd just like to make a quick comment. It's uh, Burkilo. Ah, uh, nice. For 25 years, I got a toque, and I did misspeak in my uh, presentation. The patients are not prone; <laughs> they are supine. Um, I saw the comment there, and I burst out laughing. I just imagined my big mama is laying prone for an oh. endovaginal scan. <laughs> Oh dear. Oh dear. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I have visuals. Okay. Thank okay. You.